I'll be talking about five major problems with the Trinity and my intention here is to approach the matter from a an internal perspective so that only happens once so I wanted to be sure you saw it so. but uh, but our strategy is to assume the Trinity is true and see from an internal perspective what problems there might be. And the reason why I'm, I'm approaching it from this angle, there's this idea that people aren't willing to really consider a new option until they're convinced their old option is somehow inadequate. And, you know, unless we're honest with what would convert us to the Trinity or whatever other option, um, I, I think we'll, we'll continue to struggle in talking with others because we can share with them our proof texts. We can share with them 1 Timothy 2.5, John 17.3, 1 Corinthians 8.6, uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, Psalm 110.1, and so on. All these texts, magnificent verses that teach these things. But un unless their, their theological model is in some way challenged, they're going to interpret those from within their fr frame of mind, and they're going to not really even have an interest in further investigating the subject a lot of times. So what I'd like to do is approach a subject from within. Let's just assume the Trinity is true for the sake of this conversation. And then I'd like to point out five problems from an internal perspective that would arise if we approach it this way. So let's all pretend for now that the Trinity is true and see what sort of problems we would have. I do want to mention another, one other thing, and that is that 1 Peter 3.15 teaches us that when we do defend things for God, we do so in a gentle and respectful way. And nobody is going to want to listen to what we have to say if we don't do it in a way that's respectful to their position. However absurd their position may seem to us, or, and vice versa, however absurd our position may seem to, seem to them. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you some ammunition, but I'm asking you to to use it in a way that's godly. Um, and a lot of these things you, you probably already know, but I just think this internal perspective might help us all. So the problem number one as Trinitarians is that Jesus was a Jew. And the problem with Jews is that um, they have this creed about God. And in the first century, Jews did not believe in the Trinity. And Yaku was talking about a lot of scholars. Well, I don't even think you could find one that says Jews apart from Jesus and his movement, believed in the Trinity. I mean, there's not, like, nobody even has ever even thought that, I don't think. Uh, so that's, that's an ironclad statement. And the reason why the Jews don't believe in the Trinity, then or now, is because of the Jewish scriptures that proclaim monotheism. So if we look at Deuteronomy 4, 35 and 39, for example, you guys are familiar with these verses, I think. To you it was shown so that you would acknowledge that Yahweh is God. There is no other besides him. People reading these texts are going to come away with a certain perspective that there's only one God named Yahweh and there's no other. So acknowledge today and take to heart that Yahweh is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. And so this idea of Jewish monotheism is really troubling. And so if I say statement one, Jews did not believe in the Trinity in the first century. Statement two, Jesus was a Jew. Jew. Conclusion, Jesus did not believe in the Trinity. You know, it seems like a very ironclad statement, but what's the comeback? The comeback is, well, how do we know Jesus didn't differ with the Jews in their common understanding of who God was? And our response to that is Mark 12, 28 to 34, which is a conversation. I mean, it's really an excellent thing to look at because what if we could find a conversation between Jesus and a Jew about who God is and see if they disagreed? And, and the best kind of Jew to have this sort of conversation with would be an expert in the scriptures, a scribe. A scribe would be the best person for Jesus to have a conversation with about God's identity to talk about differences or similarities and so on. And, and what do we find when we read such a text is the scribe comes up to Jesus and this scribe is, he's not, he's not fitting the mold of a scribe trying to pose a trick question to Jesus. He's, he's not in that category. He's just checking Jesus out. Um, and he says to Jesus, what's the first and great commandment? You, you know the story, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what Jesus says. Good Jewish response. You find the same thing today if you ask the Jew. Even if it, if it was a liberal Jew or a conservative or Orthodox Jew, they all say the same thing. 
That's, that's the core of our faith as a people. And so Jesus is responding like a good Jew and saying that God is one and you're supposed to love him. And that both of those things are important. And so Jesus confesses this Shema and he doesn't alter the creed. He doesn't alter, he doesn't add other statements like compound before one. He doesn't say, here Israel, the Lord our God is a compound unity and you should love them. He doesn't, he doesn't alter it. He just leaves it as one. And then the question is, how would a Jewish scribe have heard this? Would a Jewish scribe have heard this creed as a Trinitarian creed or a non-Trinitarian creed? And of course the response is, um, a non-Trinitarian would hear the Shema as a, as a non-Trinitarian creed. And so Jesus has a real opportunity then. Because we know historically that that Jewish scribe, who was not part of Jesus' movement whatsoever, had a non-Trinitarian understanding of the Shema. And we know that the Shema should be understood as three persons in one essence. I told you we're pretending to be Trinitarians, right? So that's the correct understanding of the Shema from our perspective as Trinitarians. So this Jewish scribe has an incorrect interpretation of the Shema. And so Jesus has to now explain to him the additions, or at least corrections, or at least throw in some sort of uncertainty here. Otherwise, Jesus is complicit in this Jewish scribe's ignorance and is even misleading him to continue not believing in the Trinity, even though he's the second person of the Trinity. So you see how this is a problem for us as Trinitarians. Um, how could this Jewish scribe have heard this? And so the scribe, and we, and we know how the Jewish scribe took it, because he responded, uh, he is one, and besides him there is no other. That's how he understood the Lord is one, when he heard it. He said, well, what you mean by that is he is one and there is no other. So it's very explicit what's going on here. And here, here's what Jesus does. He, he doesn't alter, he doesn't criticize this Unitarian reading of the Shema. Rather, he highly praises the scribe and says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And so in this encounter, the, the Jew who doesn't believe in the Trinity and Jesus who does believe in the Trinity, presumably, agree on the same definition of God. So that's a contradiction, right? It, that can't happen. If Jesus really did believe in the Trinity, he should have corrected the Jew with more information. And so that's a problem for us. That's, that's the first problem, the Jewishness of Jesus. And Jesus isn't just a Jew in an ethnic sense. It's not just because of his birth that he was a Jew. He was a practicing Jew. He held the faith of Judaism. And that's what Mark 12, 28 to 34 teaches us, is that he held as his own personal core creed, the core creed of Judaism itself. So he's not just ethnically Jewish, he's uh, f Jewish in faith as well. Problem number two is that the Trinity is never explained in Scripture. For us as Trinitarians, this is difficult because we should expect to find a book in the Bible called Trinity, and it should have three chapters in it, and each chapter should have one verse, or 33 verses, or 313 verses. There should be some sort of like divine, inspired, creative teaching on this doctrine in the Bible. But let's look at this a little bit more. Someone could put together, and I, I recognize this, you can take a verse from Matthew 28, 19, you can take John 1, 1, you can take 1 John 5, 7 in the forged Greek version that Erasmus used and other random verses, and you can, you can pull together something. But that only works if you have it a priori. In other words, if you, if you already have your model, your theological system in place, then you can do this work of pulling verses together to build this Trinitarian edifice. But without that, you can't do it, and that's a problem for us. This is not the same as something being explained in Scripture. For example, I'll, I'll give you a silly example. Um, the doctrine that Peter tempted Eve in the garden. Peter the Apostle tempted Eve. Right? That's, my, that's my belief. I founded a church on it. If you don't believe that, you can't come. And so how do I get that? Well, you know, it says that the serpent tempted Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. In Revelation 12, it says that old serpent is the devil and Satan. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So it was Peter in the garden that tempted Eve. So you can, you can do this with Scripture. If you have a theory, you can pull together verses in a way that seems logical, but it doesn't work. 
Um, and thankfully, nobody believes that yet. Don't, don't take that one seriously. <laughs> Want to start a new denomination? Should we do that? <laughs> okay, so what is the Trinity? Now, we, we have to realize the Trinity is a very complicated thing. It, it's the belief that there's one God in three persons. Um, it, it's the belief that these persons are co-eternal. So that means all of them had no beginning. The Father had no beginning. The Son had no beginning. The Holy Spirit had no beginning. Uh, it, they're co-essential. They share the same essence or substance or being. They're co-equal but not just in, a sense, in the sense of rank or functionality. They're co-equal in, in a more subtle sense. They're, they're co-equal in the sense that they, in their essence, are all, none is before or behind the other. But in their function, in the economic trinity, in the plan of salvation's outworking, they're able to be unequal. So the Son can be unequal to the Father as he incarnate, as he's incarnate, but he's not really unequal in his essence, right? So that's all bound up in this word co-equal. Um, and what I'm doing is just listing the necessary components of the Trinity. I mean, there are probably more, but these are just ones that I think without these concepts, not even the words, like say you don't want to use the word person, say you want to say individual or center of consciousness, doesn't matter. The concept is required to talk about the Trinity. All right, so these are all necessary concepts to talk about it. Eternal generation is the idea that uh, you can say these two things about at the same time, eternal and son. All right, so in order for Jesus to be God, he had to have always existed, right? Because God is eternal. So you need eternal in there to be God. But, you know, if you're eternal, you don't have a moment when you were begotten. You don't have a beginning if you're eternal, right? So in order to say son, he needs to have some sort of beginning, some sort of generation, procreation from the father. And so we say eternal generation. It's a very complex concept if you really try to wrap your mind around it. Um, and it's necessary to talk about the Trinity. The dual natures of Christ in one person, absolutely fundamental. You can't have a Trinity unless you have these things. And since we are Orthodox Trinitarians, we believe in all these things. In their union, each nature preserves its distinct attributes. We're not confusing the two, the divine and human natures, together like the mono monophysites did, and we're not dividing them apart like the Nestorians. We are Orthodox Trinitarians, right? So we need all these extra things, you might call it baggage, to in order, in order to be orthodox, right? And there's two wills in Christ. That's on the books. Nobody usually studies that one. But uh, there was a controversy called the monothelitism controversy. Uh, we'll, we'll get more into that in a moment. But uh, it's the idea that there are two wills in Christ, but they never disagreed, right? But it's only one person. One person and two natures. Um, sorry, there it is. One person and two natures. Uh, natures are preserved. Wills are separate, but working together, okay? So this is the Trinity. There's probably a few things I missed, but this is just off the top of my head. The necessary components to talk about the Trinity. So let, let, let's go ahead and concede. The scriptures never say the word Trinity. They never say the phrase God the Son. They never say the, the, the word co-equal. Co in fact, they never say any of this. Not only do they never say any of these words, but none of these concepts anywhere are explained in scripture. Like, there's no verse that explains that there are two natures and it's important to preserve the distinct attributes of each. Like, there's just no verse. Maybe in the book of Hezekiah or something. But uh, that's not in the Bible. So, you know, that's a problem for us is that the Trinity is never actually explained in Scripture. It has to be read alongside it. And so... Here's, here's my last point here. The Trinity is like an oral tradition taught alongside scriptures. Typically, historians call it the rule of faith. And it's this idea that you have an oral tradition taught alongside scriptures, passed down from the apostles from generation to generation, and it was never written down and nobody really talked about it until the heretics came and started challenging it, and then we get books about it. Um, and so that's the idea of oral tradition. But the problem with the Trinity as an oral tradition is that it puts it in the same group of uh, thinking as the Pharisees who had these oral traditions that Jesus was just always challenging. Like not washing his hands before dinner or disagreeing about tithing mint and cumin while neglecting their parents because 
the tradition of Corbin allowed them not to take care of their parents, or or any of these different oral traditions that Jesus was always bucking up against. And it puts the Trinity in the same category as that. And that's that's not good. So, is it really necessary if it's never explained by Jesus or the apostles or in Paul? Let's move on to the next one. Problem number three. No Jews who converted to Christian... This is, this, is this is the problem of controversy. Controversy. No Jews who converted to Christianity ever challenged the Trinity. Now, we're, again, we're assuming the Trinity is true. We're, assim- we're assuming that Jesus believed it. We're assuming the apostles taught it. So, if the apostles taught the Trinity as part of their evangelism efforts to Jewish people, there should be some historical controversy. There should be some Jew somewhere that says, wait a second, this doesn't fit with what my grandpa told me. This doesn't isn't, this isn't fit with what the rabbi taught me in synagogue. This doesn't fit with what mama read me the scriptures the other day. Right? So let's, let's think about this a little bit more. Suppose a Unitarian missionary went into a mainstream church, and upon being invited to speak a few words, they explained that the Father is the only true God. Right? Just imagine that. You get invited to a, a Baptist church or a Roman Catholic church, and there's this meet and greet part where you stand up and introduce yourself, and you stand up and you say, Hi, you know, my name's Sean, here's my wife Ruth, and here's, here's our children. We're so glad to be here, and we just want to let you know that we've discovered that the Father is the only true God, and that the Son is not God, and the Holy Spirit is not God. Those are, those are lies that have been taught to us, and we're just so glad to be here. Thank you for welcoming us. Right? Would that be received well? Would somebody come up to us and talk to us afterwards? Would there be controversy if I did that again? I think so. And so, to think that in the first century, they're preaching this message, including the doctrine of the Trinity, and nobody gets mad about that, is really... Non uh, it's just bad history. It's 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 to not think about it. So, what about this? What if they? What if they? What if you had this idea that in the first century it was the golden age, and in the first century nobody argued about things. There wasn't controversy in the first century. When Jesus taught in the first century, when the apostles taught in the first century, the Spirit opened people's eyes to to understand it and to hear it and believe it, and there wasn't controversy because God was at work. Right? That's an interesting theory. So there are controversies in the New Testament. In fact, the New Testament is full of controversies, isn't it? Jesus is controversial from the moment he's born. Herod's sending out the people to to have him eliminated, right? So Corinth is full of controversies from the factions in the early chapters where I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, to the speaking in tongues handled in chapter 14, to uh, impropriety at communion in chapter 11. 2 Corinthians is filled with controversy, these other super apostles taking over. Um, You've got general controversy in Acts chapter 15 over whether or not Gentiles should be accepted into the church without first becoming Jews. And then you've also got controversy theologically being worked out in Paul's opinion whether or not justification comes through the works of the law. And so the, the New Testament in the first century is just brimming with controversy, actually. But here's the funny thing. Out of all the things there are to argue about, they never argue about the Trinity. Like, nobody ever brings it up. So these are the three options. Number one, the Trinity did not exist yet. Two, it existed but wasn't taught. So they believed in it, but just nobody talked about it. <laughs> or it wasn't that important. Number three, it was taught, but it caused no controversy whatsoever among monotheistic Jewish communities. And that's a conspiracy theory. It's like, yeah, nobody, there was no controversy on this one thing. You know, it's, it's an ad hoc theory you just throw out there in order to keep your belief system in place. So this is a real problem for us. Um, and you have this myth of primacy. I'm not going to talk about that. You have like a little outline that gives some more stuff. So let's look at history. When do we find controversy? Right, Steve? When do we find it? 325, right? And the Arian thing starts about 318 when Arius and his bishop Alexander... Arius was a priest in good standing at the church in Alexandria, by the way, in Egypt. Uh, He was a priest in good standing, and he claimed his doctrine was traditional. That was one of the things he says in his Thalia, the, the one thing that survived from Arius. So in 318, that controversy starts. By 320... 
There's a local synod held and in Alexandria, and Arius is, is condemned. And then in 325 is when you have the big council, Nicaea 1. And what's the question? Because councils are always for controversies. Did you know that? I, I just kind of realized that recently. Like the Jerusalem council, the very first one in Acts 15, why do they have that? Was it because everyone was getting along and we're like, let's do some creative theology? <laughs> what, 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 are, what, what is the Gentile relationship vis-a-vis -vis God, God's redemption plan in our time? Let's, let's just pontificate. No, it was like, you have Judaizers and you have Libertines and you have these two things, and then we have to figure out an answer here, right? And so they had a council and they decided Gentiles don't need to keep the law in order to be accepted as full Christians. Um, and they sent out letters, right? So you have, count, you have controversy, counsel, and then you have letters. And or they call, later on they call them canons that are like rules that, or enforcements that are sent out. So 325, the controversy is whether or not the son is eternal and what's his relationship to the father. What do they decide? The son has always existed. He is at the same level as the father. Homoousios is the same substance or essence as the father. 381. It's so interesting because you, you would figure having imperially, an imperially sanctioned creed and a council that is endorsed by all these bishops would just put an end to the problems, right? I mean, they always believed in the Trinity from the beginning. Everybody just believed it without a controversy, supposedly, and the, until this heretic came along, and then we dealt with him, and now all is well. That's what we would expect if it were all true the way we just said it. But instead, we don't. In fact, we find the Council of Nicaea, the first one, is really more like um, something that generates more councils than the other way around. So 381, we have Constantinople 1. The question is, is the Holy Spirit the third person? Answer, yes. <coughs> third council, and there are hundreds of councils. These are just the seven big ones that are called the ecumenical councils. So number three is in 431 in Ephesus. I got to actually visit the church, or the remains of the church where this council was held. And the question there was, was Mary the bearer of Christ's divine nature? or just of his human nature. It is Mary Theotokos, right? Is she the bearer of God, or is she Christotokos, just the bearer of Christ? And there was a big controversy over that. Nestorius said she's Christotokos, uh, Togos, and uh, Cyril of Alexandria, uh, a very uh, nefarious character, said he's Theotokos, and outwitted Nestorius and got him excommunicated from not only the church, but the whole empire. So that's 431. Every one of these has all kinds of political machinations where there, there, there are all kinds of seedy, questionable ethics going on. So 451, you have Chalcedon. And so now it's 125, 126 years after the first one. And now we're finally ready to address the question, how are Jesus' two rela natures related to each other, the God and the human nature? So we have another huge controversy that's dealt with with the council, but it doesn't even end there. In 553, we have Constantinople II. How can we interpret the dual natures a little bit more? <coughs> In 681, we have Constantinople III, the sixth ecumenical council, which is about the monophyletism controversy. Um, did Christ have one or two wills? Correct answer, two. And, and the number seven is in 787, we have Nicaea II, which is can icons of Christ be worshipped? Big controversy in the city of Constantinople over that and in the empire because people were saying, well, you're just worshipping the human nature of Christ as represented in that icon. You're not, you're, you, what you're doing is you're, you're making him into one nature again. You're going against Chalcedon. And so there's this big controversy, all kinds of fights. You've got big stuff going on in the empire, the Byzantine Empire. And so they said, no, it's all right, you can do that. So that's number seven. So what I'm saying is the Trinity is inherently controversial. And if we can liken it to a fruit tree, we must say that the fruit on that tree is not good. The tree itself produces bad fruit. And that is evidenced by all these councils. And every one of these councils, the loser gets kicked out of the church. And so you have to keep kicking people out of the church. And so the Trinity is inherently, as a doctrine, divisive. And that's a problem for us. So if the myth of the Trinity was true, then it always existed, then why were there four and a half centuries of controversies once people started thinking about the Trinity? So that's the controversy issue. Number four, God is always addressed using singular personal pronouns. And you see, I wrote always in a different color there, more or less. God is always spoken of using singular personal pronouns. 
And God, is almost, God almost always speaks in uh, singular personal pronouns, right? Do you see the difference between those three phrases? This is a grammatical part, and if, if you don't like grammar, I'm sorry. But I think a lot of us are familiar with the pronoun argument. When people speak to God, they always say you, singular. In English, in the North, we only have one word for you. And if we're talking to one person, we say you. If we're talking to 500 people, we say you. Down here, I realize it's different. But uh, usually the Bible is written using the northern dialect of American English. <laughs> and so in the Bible, we see just the word you, whether it's one person or 50 people, right? But in Greek, it's not like that. They have different words for you if it's singular or plural. And so the biblical text really does only ever address God using the you singular. They never say y'all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is always spoken of. So whenever somebody talks about God, whenever, I'm making an absolute statement. Find me one exception if you disprove this. I mean, whenever God is spoken of, they always say he. They always say he. They never say they. Always singular. And then the third one is God always says I when he talks, unless he's talking to other people who he's including in the action, in which case he says us. Four times, right? And so... If you said, if Adam said to Dan, let's go grab a cup of coffee. This, this guy's boring. <laughs> let's go freshen up a bit and we'll come back. Please don't do that. You're right in the front. So um, would, would, would Adam, would an onlooker to this interaction, that maybe they only saw Adam, they didn't see Dan over there, and they, and they saw Adam saying, let's go get a cup of coffee, would they automatically think to themselves, Adam's schizophrenic. Adam's talking to another person of Adam within himself. Or would they say, oh wait, there's Dan behind the camera there. He's talking to someone else, right? I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? If we say us, we mean ourselves and whoever it is we're talking to. So when God says us, it just means the same thing as when anyone else says us. That's the whole beauty of the word us, is that it always means us. So... Other than those four times, the other 20,000 or whatever, uh, God always says I, right? So singular personal pronouns are used for singular persons. I know that that might sound very boring, but the implications for us as Trinitarians are devastating because as Trinitarians, we believe that God is a multiplicity of persons. We believe there's one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if God is three persons, then we can't use singular pronouns because singular personal pronouns are used for singular persons, right? And so there's a real grammatical problem with our Bibles that we should probably correct as Trinitarians. If God were a trinity, we should find plural pronouns, right? But we don't. Thousands of times we are confronted by the fact that God is a singular individual. He is a single individual. Um, I'm not going to talk about these, but if you want to check the NIV Study Bible or the Net Bible, both Bibles are, are done by mainstream Christians. They both say that God's talking to the angels in John or Genesis 1.26. And I also checked in my school. I looked at the commentaries that we have there, Word Biblical Commentary, um, some other ones. I looked, at pro I looked at all of them. And any commentary written in the 20th or 21st century, they all said the same thing, that God's talking to the angels there. He's not talking to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Um, it was only uh, John Gill's commentary. I think it's John Gill. Is that the name of the guy? Uh, You've got to watch out for these freebie ones you get on the web because they're always the ones that are out of copyright. And consequently, they're usually from the 1800s, and consequently, they're usually just grossly out of touch with modern scholarship, which uh, has improved in this one area. Um, so problem number five, this is that Jesus was not omniscient. So this is, this is from uh, Latin. Omnis is um, all, and uh, scient, or science is the word we get science from, it means knowledge. So he's not all-knowing. And so that's that's going to be a problem. God knows everything that can be known. I think from Calvinist to open theist, we can agree with that particular formulation. God knows everything that can be known. Whatever persuasion you are, we can affirm position two, right? Or statement two here. But if the Trinity is true, then Jesus is fully God. And so he should have full knowledge, 
right? Here's the problem. Mark 13, 32. Jesus says, about that day and hour, no one knows. So am I going to believe Jesus or whoever this other person is? I don't know. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So this is Jesus confessing to not knowing something. He's confessing ignorance about the issue of whether or not, or of when he's coming back. So Jesus says he doesn't know something. We have two options. Did Jesus really not know, or was he lying? Jesus, as God, really did know, but pretended not to know. Option number one. Or, Jesus really did not know, and therefore is not really God. At least not in a Trinitarian sense. So, for us, this is a problem. This is another one of these major problems, because either we have Jesus misrepresenting himself, lying, saying he didn't know something that he really did know, or he's God, or he's not God. So either he's God and he's lying, or he's not God. That's, none of those, neither of those are acceptable from a Trinitarian perspective. So this is a real point of tension. Um, and we know that this was historically very difficult for, for Christianity because in the Matthew version, a scribe changed it. He took out the Son. So it's just the angels and the Father. But nobody ever messed with the Mark 13, 32 one. I think a more um, efficient or, or more detailed minded scribe would have fixed the Mark one too, but maybe he was just copying Matthew. I don't know. But we have a, 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 a strand of uh, manuscript families that omit it from Matthew, but it's always there in Mark, so it's textually certain. And yet we have evidence that there's uncomfortableness about this verse in the Matthew uh, manuscript tradition. So what's the comeback? You've heard it, right? My friends from Australia. When Jesus said he didn't know, he was speaking out of his human nature. And he's, when he did other things, he was doing it out of his divine nature, right? So he wasn't speaking as God. He was speaking as man when he said he didn't know because humans don't have full knowledge and God does. So if he speaks and says, I don't know something, he's saying that as a man but not as God. Okay, so that's the comeback. We, you guys, have, have you heard that comeback before? Yes. In conversation? Okay. So here's the response. But the Trinity teaches that there's only one person subsisting in two natures. So the thing that you're interacting with, the, the being, the person that you're interacting with, that's what there can only be one of. So if he has a divine nature and a human nature, let's assume that he does, he still only has one mind. He still only has one person out of which he interacts with you. You understand? So if we're going to say that, well, in his human mind and his divine mind, we've split the person and we're on, all Nestorian heretics. So we can't say that. It's an invalid response to the Mark 13, 32 problem. And it makes us heretics. Which, as Trinitarians, we're trying not to be heretics. But it's, it's hard work. He cannot have two minds, one that knew something and another that did not know something, unless we now want to make the absurd claim that mind and person are not correlated. That's what you're stuck with. Mind and person are not anything to do with each other. But I mean, if you think about that for a moment, that's absolutely the, the epitome of absurdity as, as a contradiction. And if we had Yaku up here, he could do a syllogism for us and uh, thoroughly make that point more clearly. I hope, I, hope, uh, I hope he improves on all these ideas in his own uh, future work. So here's, here's my conclusion, uh, the five problems. Again, I, I, I suspect you have familiarity with these five things already, but just maybe this angle of approach might help you in conversation with others where rather than initially targeting them with verses that you consider very good for a Unitarian understanding, you can first talk a little bit about their own perspective. And it's really helpful for us to do that if we are informed on what their perspective is. And if we say to them something like, you believe that Jesus is the Father, that's crazy. And then they say, well, we're Trinitarians, we don't believe that. Then, then there's a real problem, right? Because Trinitarians don't believe Jesus is the Father. They believe they're both persons of God. It's more complicated than the, the cruder uh, oneness position. Uh, cruder, or uh, I, don't, I don't mean to say a negative word like that, but uh, the Trinity is very complicated. It took absolutely brilliant people to come up with this, uh, these ideas. 
Um, it just so happens that it's wrong. But here we go through just one more time. Jesus affirmed the theology of no, a non-Trinitarian Jewish scribe. Two, the Trinity is never explained in Scripture. Three, there's no controversy over the Trinity in the first century. Four, singular pronouns exclude the notion of multiple persons of God. And five, Jesus was not omniscient. I just did five because I wanted to fit it into a relatively reasonable amount of time. Six, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a name. That's kind of a problem if it's a person, right? Seven, eight, you know, we could go on with this. And I think as a community, we could probably generate 50. But it's nice to have just five so that it's easy to remember and to use in conversation. And another thing, just one last point. If you're not sure about what the Trinity is, join the club. I studied this at school. I went to Boston College, sat there with Jesuits in my class. None of them know what it is either. The professor doesn't. She says, well, I think that person, or I think will, is an attribute of nature, not of person. And we're sitting there we're like, did you just say that? I mean, that doesn't even make any sense at all. I mean, and, and we ask her about it, and she said, I don't know. You know, so none of us know what the Trinity really is. We're all just consulting books. You try to read these early church fathers, and they, they're fighting over what it is. They don't know what it is. They're trying to figure it out. So the, the most effective thing to do then in an evangelism encounter when, when talking with real people is to ask them questions, to find out what kind of trinity they believe in, if at all, before even applying these five things. You know, it's really helpful to, to do that first.